Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to our Sunday School lesson for this Sunday, July 21st of 2024. If you've been uh, getting outside lately, you know it's been very hot, uh, but I'm looking ahead at the weather forecast. It says we might have some days in the 80s this week and possibly a few days of rain. Uh, that would be answered prayer. Uh, thank you folks for praying with me. Uh, as we uh, pray for rain for our community, for our farmers and for those people uh, that need their crops and their hay fields to get some rain. Uh, I want to let you know that I do thank you, uh, those of you that listen every week. Uh, I should appreciate you. I uh, have several that uh, listen to it online and come Sunday morning and uh, hear our Sunday School lesson. A little bit different version. I try to make it a little bit different, but sometimes I share the same thing. Uh, but today uh, is a very important lesson of a lesson that we all could take, as the old folks say, you could take a lesson from this lesson. Uh, today's title is called Serving. Serving others leads to greater kingdom work. As we've been studying uh, going and finding Jesus and where he's working uh, will cause us to have uh, bigger and greater blessings uh, from God. I'm going to tell you three stories this morning uh, to start our lesson as an introduction. Uh, I don't want to make the introduction long, but I think these three stories uh, tell a good story. Uh, or gives us a good introduction to the day's lesson about serving. Heard a preacher recently tell a story about his church in the western part uh, of our country. He said several years ago, the wildfires, uh, and when I read this, uh, I heard this story, I remember about hearing about the wildfires in the west. Several years ago, wildfires devastated large patches of northern California's countryside. During the fires, several of the fires burned uh, people's houses, uh, just total loss of their houses. Uh, during this uh, loss of their houses, uh, the families that lived in them were counting on these houses to be their primary residence and their only place to live. So, of course, once they lost their houses, they were displaced. But guess what happened? Several of the fires caused people living in uh, this area to lose all their clothing, all their possessions, and their house. But near to these wildfires, and these where these people lost their houses, uh, there was a church. Uh, near was a church. Uh, and these people uh, were needing a place to stay. So the church stepped up and offered them a, quickly uh, a pl place for them to stay as their homes were destroyed. The local church, along with other churches, decided to convert parts of their educational buildings and their fellowship buildings into temporary housing for some of these families uh, that suddenly had no home. Over a period of weeks, uh, until more better housing could be found for them, members of these churches ministered to these people who had before uh, this, these fires and these wildfires, they had never had any contact with the church and with the fellow Christians around them. Their effort turned into a labor of love, was very costly to the church, but the church received the benefits and were glad to serve these people. And, the, and this preacher mentioned the members grew from this service. Have you ever had the opportunity to, to serve other people? Uh, it might have cost you a little bit, but you got the greater blessing. A second story was told of about how a local church was contacted to provide a space for the local AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. This church decided to help. Neither membership nor attendance at the church was required for these people to come 
and participate in the AA meetings. Many of the participants had never paid uh, any visits to any church. Many of the participants had never participated in a church at all. But the folks at the local churches welcome AA to their church. Uh, and these folks, as they came to AA, they had an opportunity to witness to these folks and invite them to come to their church during the regular church meetings. And the part that I like, and to their fellowships. Uh, their fellowships sometimes involved eating and serving them with food and beverages. These folks received the help they needed, and the church received the blessing as they uh, assisted in helping, turning the lives of these folks that were addicted to alcohol around. Today, I ask you, uh, would the church that you attend, would the church that you participate with be willing to turn their fellowship hall into a motel room? Would they be willing to turn their fellowship hall into a double-A meeting? A third story was told of a church where a large group of immigrants uh, settled in their community. Of course, they spoke another language. English was not their primary language, but this church decided to tackle this opportunity by having church services and having church services provided by someone that spoke their language. They hired additional staff that spoke their language gave the folks a space to have church and encouraged some of its ch church members to help with the service, uh, with the music, and in the witnessing, and in the being a part uh, of these immigrants as they participated in church. Uh, as I read this story, it said, both the mother church members and the immigrant members received huge blessings from what this church did to try to serve uh, these immigrants. You may ask, why did these churches launch new programs, spend money, and, or create new ministries for folks that quite possibly they didn't even know? Why did they spend time to handle the needs of these people in three different situations? Why did they do that? Uh, surely the situations were not easy to handle. But each story I read, and they were all true stories, showed how those that participated in serving those in need were said to have received great blessings. Serving other people. I found the older I get, the more blessings I get uh, when I'm able to help or serve other people. I prayed this week as I prepared for this lesson, Lord. Uh, I have several things on my heart, and I ask you and I cherish your prayers uh, to ask God to send me an answer uh, to a question that I have right now. I'm asking his leadership, uh, but in the meantime, I'm staying faithful to God's work. I want to stay humble. Uh, in his opportunity. Sometimes as we're told that we're not prepared and we're not ready or we're not capable of handling certain situations, uh, I've learned that if God's in it, he'll prepare us. We learned in our experience in God lessons this week. God will give you the ability for the situations that he wants you to be part of. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that we studied several weeks ago, uh, in the book of Acts. Let me go back. Uh, Jesus told his disciples, he said, I'm going to leave you. I'm going back to sit at the right hand of the Father. Uh, but before I go, let me charge you with this mission. Go forth and be witnesses unto me and to Jerusalem and to Judea and to Samaria and to, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And the book of Acts records how the new church grew uh, it records the growth of the new Christian church. So far, we've studied about how the church grew in and around Jerusalem in the first five chapters of Acts. Today, we move to chapter 6, where the Bible talks about growing pains 
that the church had. Growing pains, those are good things. And how the disciples handled a couple of the growing pains. It seemed the church as it grew had incorporated some Greek-speaking people into its fellowship. Gentiles, they call them, uh, Greek-speaking people. This led to a multilingual church. The new church was getting different languages, different people, different groups of immigrants uh, were coming into this new church. They were not all the same now. They were different type of people. Because you see, Jesus said, go to the uttermost part of the earth. It seems the church as it grew were incorporating other people. And there was a problem that happened. Look with me uh, at Acts chapter 6 and the first four verses. Acts chapter 6 and the first four verses. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring, murmuring among the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give up, give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It seems a little small conflict came up in the new church. This conflict came up between the, and as I studied this week, they call them the Hellenistic Christians and the Jewish Christians. The first problem that they encountered was uh, there were two types of people, and they spoke two different languages. Uh, I had to find this, but uh, I think I'm right in this and saying correct in saying this. But I learned this week that the Jews, most of the Jews spoke around Jerusalem. They stopped, spoke Aramaic. Uh, it, it's been said that even Jesus, growing up in Bethlehem, spoke Aramaic. The Hellenistic Christians spoke Greek. Uh, these were the Gentiles that had a, Jew, a Greek or a Grecian background. The Jewish Christians and Luke, the author of Acts, says here that a problem came up with the Hellenistic Christians. The first problem then was that they spoke different languages. The second problem, typically in the church, there were poor folks and widows that had been left behind with no families. And these folks needed help because they had lost the men of their family. Uh, they physically needed help. They needed food. They needed money, uh, like to use to buy food so that they can continue to live. It had become, and it was uh, well known, the synagogues where the Hellenistic Jews or the Hellenistic Greeks came from, their synagogues uh, were most likely helping these folks uh, in their time of need. I also learned this week the Jewish synagogues had a practice of receiving two regular contributions for the needy people. A weekly contribution to their members uh, that was to be providing 14 meals. Uh, that would have been two meals a day uh, for their widows, the Jewish widows. And also they provided a daily distribution of food for transients. This transient uh, daily distribution of food was known as the tambui. It seems that although unintentional, uh, the Jewish churches, the Jewish people in the new church had neglected to take care of the newish or these new Greek Hellenistic members and their weed widows. Uh, they basically forgot. They had already provided for their widows and needy people, but they forgot to include the Hellenistic widows and needy people. Verse 1 says, uh, these widows were being overlooked. You can uh, understand there how, uh, as I studied this week, I learned that it was quite li most likely an oversight. 
These problems came to the attention of the apostles. In an effort to gain a solution, the apostles took the problem uh, to the new church, to uh, the members of the church, sort of like the Baptists do. But we have to appoint a committee to do it first. The apostles felt their responsibility was to continue preaching and teaching and spreading the gospel Jesus, just as Jesus had missioned them to do. They also felt what they were doing was already a full-time job. And it was apparent they were doing a great job because the church was growing. The church was multiplying. You had got new members. These new members were Gentiles now. The apostles felt that they should not give up the preaching of the word to wait on tables or to wait uh, on these needy folks. They felt like that they needed someone to take charge of this mission. So the apostles proposed to all the uh, brothers and sisters of the church to elect seven men with certain characteristics to handle the needs of the widows. Many folks, many theologians, uh, one of the commentaries I read said uh, in this situation, it's understood by theologians that this was the appointing or the method are the requirements that were needed uh, for what would later be known as the deacons. The first thing that these uh, apostles, these new apostles that they wanted to panel to take, take care of these widows, the first requirement was to be a man of good reputation, a man of good character, a man having good knowledge of the faith, a man that studied God's word, and would spread the God's word faithfully every day uh, that would attend all the worship services of the church uh, that was faithful and of good character to God's name. The second thing was the requirements for these men. These men mean to be known by both the Jewish Christians and the Hellenistic Christians. Third, these men were to be filled with the spirit and wisdom of the church activities uh, in accordance with all the church functions. These men uh, were to serve all the people of the church, so they wanted to know about all the different needs of the church. Fourth, these men needed to have demonstrated faith and wisdom in their past decisions and actions. They were to be men that had never discouraged other people uh, they were always encouragers, as we studied about Barnabas, the son of encouragement. The fruit of the Spirit should be in them. Fifth, these men needed to understand the needs of the people in the church. And the apostles made it clear that no one in the church, either widows or needy people, were to be neglected. So they set up a, pro a process uh, whereby they were going to take care of all the needy and all the widows. <clears throat> now look with me at Acts chapter 6, verses 5, 6, and 7. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte, proselyte of Antioch whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient in the faith. The whole company of disciples now began to spread. The whole company of disciples spread with the proposal. They were agreed. The proposal was agreed by the whole church. And they, be, and they sat down and they chose seven spiritual men full of the faith and full of the Holy Ghost. I learned this week that all seven of these men that they chose also had Grecian names. That is an important fact because it was assured. These seven man, men could understand the needs of the new Christians as well as the needs of the Jewish Christians. So the apostles laid their hands on these seven men, prayed for them, and commissioned them to do the work of serving the people. Thereby, a legitimate need was not ignored, but was addressed 
with wisdom. And the Bible says God blessed their faithfulness. God blessed their decisions. They elected Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte. Including these seven men uh, into their fellowship helped smooth out any discourses, any uh, re recourses uh, among the people in the church between the different groups of people that now were part of the new church. In the list, the first man that was named to be a new apostle was Stephen. He was characterized as full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. The last man elected was Nicholas, a proselyte. Uh, I had to look this up, but I wanted to know, so I went down, as Preacher D says, the rabbit trail. This means he was not an ethnic Jew. Instead, he probably became a Jewish convert before coming to the Christian church, and it says he was from Antioch. Good news. The Bible says with this new plan and new apostles, the word of the God increased. In fact, it says the word of God multiplied and the number of disciples grew greatly and the apostles and priests remained faithful to the faith. Uh, that is so important, especially in the world we live in today. Uh, and I heard a preacher say uh, just this past week uh, that for some reason preachers today are watering down the word of God. They don't preach about the blood anymore. Uh, but they said that these priests that were elected were full of the faith and remained faithful to the God, and God blessed them. All good. Everything's going fine, right? Hold on. Let's look. Uh, Acts chapter 6, verses 8 to 15. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose... Certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia, and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they adorned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against his holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. We learned a few weeks ago in our study of angels that God sends angels to do God's work. An angel showed up uh, for Stephen. Opposition uh, surfaces. The Bible points out about a man named Stephen, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of grace and known performing great wonders and signs among the people. But opposition to Stephen arose among the Jewish clansmen and the Jewish people, claiming Stephen had spoken blasphemous words against Moses, against God, and against the temple. Some of these men appeared to the Sanhedrin to further spread these rumors about Stephen. They wanted to get the Sanhedrin involved against Stephen. The Sanhedrin, which we know is the ruling class of Jewish priests, gathered more false witnesses to claim that Stephen was preaching against the temple and the laws. He was even claiming Jesus was going to destroy the temple and change the laws. They wondered and considered Stephen a threat to their faith. Our lesson concludes with this comment. The Jewish leaders, as they had Stephen sitting before them, hated him and hated the people that he was witnessing to and had people come before them to lie about what he had said. But now, as he appeared before the Sanhedrin in like a court-like atmosphere, when they looked at Stephen, his face was like the face 
of an angel. The man who they now wanted to kill had the appearance of one who had been in the holy presence of God. The lesson this week uh, really does not finish the story of Stephen, so I'm going to add a little bit more to it. Turn with me to Acts chapter 7, verses 57 to 60, because I want you to hear the rest of the story about Stephen. Next week we move over to chapter 8. Well, look with me now at chapter 7, verses 57 to 60. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and around upon Stephen with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to the charge of these people. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This Jewish leader, uh, the Jewish leaders couldn't stand to listen to Stephen any longer. He was preaching God's message. He was preaching what Jesus had taught him through the disciples to preach. And now he was a disciple or an apostle. They covered their ears and had him dragged outside the city. There they had him stoned to death. Before he died, Stephen followed in Jesus' footsteps, commending his spirit to the Lord and praying, God, forgive those that have stoned me. God, forgive those that are in the act of killing me. The Bible then says Stephen went to sleep. Acts chapter 8, verse 1 and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. As Stephen died <clears throat> and was entered into God's bosom, there was a man watching that would soon change his life and change the map of the new Christian church. There was a Roman citizen there by the name of Saul, who was a Roman citizen, and he was a persecutor of the Jews and the new church. But he saw Stephen full of faith. He saw his witness, and as he witnessed him being killed, he saw how he asked God to forgive him. Very soon, certain things would happen through this man's life that would cause the new church to be changed forever. The story of Saul continues into our lesson next week. <clears throat> now, as I close, let me close this way. I've always been one that felt a need to go to certain funerals. I've been to many funerals over my life. It seems that lately I've been going to more funerals. The older I get, the more I'm going to. Many friends and loved ones I've seen to go meet our Lord. The Bible says Saul was there to see Stephen being stoned and meet his Lord. When I attend the funeral of a person I know God has called home, uh, as part of what I do just to settle my nerves, I always look around to see if there are any family members there of the one that just died to go see Jesus. And I have to ask myself questions. Are there any family members here? that know Jesus because of this one that has just passed away? Have they left a legacy to their children, to their grandchildren, that they can carry on with God's message? That's what we should do, and that's my prayer, that in one small way or another, I've been able to pass God's message to you. Now, my prayer is that you will pass it down to your children, and hopefully your children will pass it down to their children, so that God's message will grow as the new church was multiplying. All right, now it's been said that the Christian church in America is on a decline. It's my goal, it's my prayer that I'll help spread and I'll help witness to one person that will be able to witness to two more people that can continue to cause God's word to be spread 
among the people. Look around your family at a funeral. Has the one that's just passed away left a legacy to some of its family members to pass God's way? As Stephen was being stoned, gave up his life, the Bible says one, not of his family, but uh, there was a man there, Saul, who had been persecuting the new church. He saw Stephen's witness in his life change the church forever. Hopefully my life will help change uh, our church and the church of God. Father, we thank you this week for this opportunity to teach your lesson. We pray in the coming days, Lord, that you will hear our prayer, Lord. Forgive us of any sins and any wrongdoings in our heart. Let people know uh, that we're praying for a clean heart, Lord. Let other people know and see that my witness is just for God. Forgive me of my sins, any wrongdoings of uh, sins of omission or sins of commission, even those sins that I don't even know uh, that I might have committed. Forgive me, Lord. Help it to be a good day for these people here that have listened. Help it to be a good week. Lord, we thank you for those that have given us words of encouragement. We pray that you'll bless those this week. Bless their families uh, as they uh, try to spread your word down to their families. In this small, small way, Lord, help me to be a witness to my family. For it's in Jesus' name that I do pray this week, Lord. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for the cooler weather that we hear is coming our way. Lord, we thank you so much for being our Lord. Hear our prayers now. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.